to government class with you today is Ms. Wokoma Tamono. Today we'll be taking a look at the theme, concepts and principles of government and we'll be looking at the topic types and characteristics of government, precisely confederalism part one. In the course of our lesson we'll be taking a look at what the term confederalism actually means and then we'll look at different characteristics and features that must be present in a state or a country before it can be called a confederal system. We'll also take a look at the functions that are being carried out by the people that play different roles in a confederal system of government. And so I expect that at the end of our class, you should be able to define the term confederalism. You should be able to identify the features of a confederal system. You should also be able to describe the distribution of power in a confederal system and examine how resources are being controlled in a confederal system. Let's take a look at our lesson. In the course of our study, we had known that government is a body or an agency that is being set up by a state or a country to actually carry out some things which are to systemize to coordinate and to also manage the state's affairs being involved. And so as a result of these different countries, different states, you know, in order to avoid anarchy, which is a state of lawlessness and bring chaos in the country, people or countries actually adopt different types of government. And so in the world today, we have people practicing different systems of government, where you hear people, oh, presidential system of government, we have federal system of government, some people go with the monarchical system of government, and their likes. All of these are the forms of government that people practice in different countries. However, there are some main types of government that people had practiced, and some countries are also practicing. Presently, there are some main types of government that some countries or states actually practice in our day. And these types of government include the unitary government, the federal government, and the confederal government. In the course of our lesson today, we'll be looking at confederal government. But I remember that in our previous lesson, we had talked about the federal system of government. And so today, our focus will be the confederal system of government. However, in our types of government where we have seen federalism, where we had seen the unitary system of government, and even where we saw confederalism. In all of these forms of government shows the different forms or ways powers are being distributed in the countries practicing them. And so the way powers are distributed in the federal system of government is quite different from the way powers are being distributed in the unitary system of government. And certainly it is different in the way powers are distributed in confederalism. In places like this, we have the distributions between the national and smaller units or smaller states. And so in places like countries that practice the federal system of government, you have the powers being given to the central government being more than the powers being given to the smaller units. And then we also have in the unitary, it's a uniformed kind of powers that are being carried out. So you really don't have to say that the powers from the central government are really higher than that of the powers given to the smaller units. And when we come to confederalism, it's a different thing. Where we have at the national level or central government, we have powers being given at a very small proportion compared to powers given to the different units or states. So this will lead us to our definition of the term confederalism. Now, what is confederalism? The term confederalism, just like we have this picture, shows a type of system of government where you have different group of sovereign states coming together to form a union and with a central government at the center. So this just tells you the different states coming together to form a union, but at the center you have a central government. Now, countries have actually practiced this form of government known as confederalism. But we must note that in practicing this form of government, those countries that have practiced have actually given room for their central government to be weak. Because in confederalism, you have at the center 
the central government, which is very weak because powers are given to the different states, like we pointed out before this point. Now in confederalism, we have the loose form of confederalism, and we also have a strict form of confederalism. Now countries that practice confederalism in its loose form are such that can be compared with the international organizations where you have like the AU, countries come in, join and become members of that group and can actually leave without any problem. They can just pull out of their membership. But then in other countries that practice it in a stricter way, you see that it's quite hard for you to pull out. And so we compare that with the federal system of government. Countries that practice this form, which is a strict form of confederalism, cannot easily pull out their membership from the organization, using the international organization as an example. So in that slide, people or countries rather cannot easily pull out from the organization. And the central government is not that weak when it comes to the strict form of confederalism. Now, most of these countries that have practiced confederalism have actually practiced it a long time ago, whereby they came together with their neighbors to get into alliance just to get collective defense and for other mutual benefits. At that time, maybe smaller nations that maybe at a point in time were threatened by other big nations would run to their neighbors and then form an alliance, form a confederation with them and become stronger to face or withstand the bigger or more powerful states that they are being threatened by. And so we will take a look at different countries that have practiced this system of government at different times. For example, some countries practiced. One of them in a long time ago was the Confederate States of America. At this period, they practiced theirs from 1861 to 1865. And then we had that of Senegambia from 1981 to 1989 and then Serbia and Montenegro from 2003 to 2006. And then lastly, we have this, Belgium. So all of this was practiced amongst the many countries that had practiced confederalism. Just a few to be mentioned. These practiced confederalism at those periods we're talking about. Now, at times when these countries practiced confederalism, a time when the country known then as the Confederate States of America practiced this. In the period of 1907, we had like five Central American states, which were, of course, sovereign states, coming together to form this Confederate States of America. So it was actually formed by five Central American states, which, of course, were independent states or sovereign states, actually came together to form the Confederate States of America, states like Guatemala, Costa Rica, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Salvador. And all of these came together to form that confederacy. And then in 1981, where we had the Senegal and Gambia, which was formed at Seni Gambia, Senegal, the country of Senegal and Gambia, joined to form this confederation. And lastly, Belgium. Belgium was one that also, like we said, practiced confederalism. But then in its practice of confederalism, it had just two autonomous entities that formed the Belgium's confederalism at that time. Two of them are Flanders, which was in the north, and then Wallonia in the south. So they came together to form the confederacy in Belgium. Don't forget that we said one major reason why these different countries actually came together to form this confederacy at the time they did was majorly to get defense and of course a kind of protection and superiority when it came to war and in battles at that time. Having looked at the definition of confederalism, I want us to know that presently in times like this, there's no country that is practicing confederalism as a system of government. And then a good example of one recent organization or a body practicing confederalism can be seen as the EU, which is known as the European Union. Now, it is seen as this because of the characteristics it has, where 
independent states or sovereign states or autonomous bodies actually come together to form the confederacy, which is, of course, having at the centre, you have a government and then you have these other states, which makes it a confederal system of government. But now, just like we have here, the European nations came together to form this European Union. And they have certain things in common which they all abide by. They have a common law, and then they also have currency. The currency they use is one that is common to them. And they also have a political body, which is known as a Congress, where laws are being made and laws are being carried out by the people in the European Union. So we can say it relates confederalism to our present day. We can use the example of the European Union. And then in confederalism, which we know as a system of government, we must note that the major functions given from the government to the parastatals or bodies that carry out these governmental functions is highly reserved for the component states, leaving the center weak. What it actually means is that major functions that are being carried out in the government are being carried out by these component states. And when they carry them out, this automatically makes the center weak, which is the central government, makes it weak. And so these component states exercise major powers in areas such as the foreign affairs. They take decisions when it comes to foreign affairs. They also take decisions on how things will be made, laws will be carried out. They make decisions on what they want to produce, their economy and all of that. The states, those individual states or component states actually make the decisions and then just allow the central government carry out what they choose to give the central government to carry out. And so we can say that the central government actually carries out or functions in different parts that are only given to it to function in by these component states and so it carries out functions such as common currency, the one who prints the currency, central government actually carries out that function, trade issues that might arise and you know it will always arise because it has to deal with two or more states, independent states. So in cases where there's a trade issue between a state and another, it is the central government that tries to resolve such matters. Now, we want you to know that in a confederal system of government, the component states are majorly sovereign states. So they are independent or autonomous states that give powers to the central government. We had already stated the fact that at the middle or at the center, we have the central government, which is a weak government. And then the states, like we have here, are strong states government. So like the arrow is showing, they are the ones that actually give powers to the central government, willingly, how much they want it. And also we must note that the sovereignty of these states are well respected, provided by the constitution that is being used in a confederal system of government. So the constitution makes room or provides that the sovereignty of these states must be respected. It means that they will still have their sovereignty and have their identity to themselves. And also note that these states have the right to secede when they decide to from this body of confederation. Now what it means is that they can easily withdraw from this confederation. Let's say this is the confederation they have all come into now to become this confederation or practicing this confederalism in this note. They can easily come out. That's what we mean to succeed. They can easily come out and say, I don't want to do again. I don't want to be part of this. I don't want to be a member of this. They can easily come out. The constitution gives room for that. We haven't looked at all of these important things that needs to be noted in a confederal system of government. We would like to look at the characteristics or features of the confederal system of government. So there are certain things you will see that will characterize a society or a country as one that is practicing confederal system of government. These include distribution of power, the way they distribute their powers should tell you if this country or if these people are practicing a confederal system of government, the constitution they also make use of 
check if they have their sovereignty and identity together still and um, being part of that confederacy. Also, if they have the right to secede, if these countries can actually pull out, become members freely and pull out, that should also tell us. And then provisions of resources and loyalty. Let's take a look at them one after the other. In the area of distribution of power, in the confederal system of government, like we had already discussed, these component states are vested with powers, are vested with so much powers that are more than the powers given to the central government, making it a weak one, right? And then they actually carry out the exclusive powers that are being given to a nation or a country by the constitution. Well, I would like us to remember that in our topic where we discussed federalism, we looked at the tiers of government where we said at the top we had the exclusive lists or exclusive powers, and then we had concurrent powers, and then we had the residual. And we said that powers in this class are strictly given to the federal government, which is the highest body in the federal system of government. So it actually tells us that the exclusive powers are reserved for the body at the apex. But here in the confederal system of government, it's the states or the states that actually have the rights or powers that are vested in the exclusive list, while the central government or central authority actually has the power to carry out the residual functions, which is the lowest in the tiers of government. Another characteristic is the constitution. The constitution, which is a source of power for any nation or country to carry out their different functions. Now that constitution that is being practiced or adopted in a confederal system of government is one that is flexible and easy to change. We have the rigid constitution and we have the flexible constitution. But in the place of confederal system of government, it is the flexible constitution that we see being adopted. In the confederal system of government, the sovereignty and identity of the people are respected and still restricted to them because the constitution provides that the component states of the confederacy should maintain and retain their sovereignty and identity. And so they still keep it while they become members of that confederacy. The component states are also empowered to take tax. Now at this point, it's not the central government that takes tax from the people of that confederacy. Rather, the states take the tax from their own people and decide on what they want to give to the central government as a decision they carry out on their own. And so you see tax is not being collected by the central government in the case of confederalism. And then the right to secede. We talked about secession being withdrawal or pulling away. The constitution gives the right and the room for any member of the confederacy to pull out. They can join and then they can pull out whenever they decide to. So they have that power, they have that right to withdraw formally from being a member of that confederacy at any time they so decide. You can break away and decide to move out, just like this fellow. And also, in confederal system of government, the provision of resources is different from the federal system of government. In the place of confederal system of government, the component states are being depended on for resources, be it natural or human resources. They are being depended on to provide these resources for the central government to maintain and defend the confederation. And then we also have that of loyalty to the component units. You find out that because of the powers that are being given to the component units, citizens in a confederacy or in a confederal system of government pay more loyalty to the component states rather than to the central government. Because to a large extent, they know that the central government depends on the states, and also the states have more powers than the central government. So in that, you see that more of powers and respect are given to these individual states or sovereign states by their citizens rather than the central government as a body. And then having looked at these characteristics and features of the confederal system of government, let us take a look at how the resources are being controlled in the federal system of government. 
But before that, I'd like us to know what resources are. Now, from our definition, we can say that resources are wealth, minerals, raw materials, supplies of goods, etc., which a country or a people or a state have access to, and they can use it to produce and also develop their own countries or their country's economy. Like we will be told that the resources are divided into the human and natural resources. At the point of human resources, human resources are resources that are embedded in people, like skills, like knowledge, like manpower that they use to gain or to get wealth that they can use to advance or develop their country or their country's economy. While that of natural resources are the resources that are embedded in the earth. They are not gotten from humans in any way. We have like mineral resources, we have minerals, we have rocks, we have rivers, etc. All of these make up the natural resources that people or country have in their land that are present or available in that country and that the people use to make wealth, create wealth, and also produce and develop themselves in one way or the other, and also develop their economy. Having looked at the definition of resources, let's take a look at how resources are being controlled in a confederal system of government. In a confederal system of government, this is an important or essential feature that must be handled with care. Like we all know, in a confederal system of government, the state, of course, is more powerful. Now, these component states in the country have the right to control their natural resources that are being found or available in their countries, states, nations, be it mineral and agricultural resources like oil, like cocoa in some countries, like canals and the rest. All of these, these states are to control them, decide on what they want to do with it, how they want to create wealth for themselves with it, and then after which they agree or decide on an approved percentage that they send to the central government. So we see that resources that are being controlled in a confederal system of government is mainly one that is done by the component units, whereby they take care of what they have, make use of what they have, generate wealth, produce wealth out of what they have, and then agree based on the approved percentages they contribute to the central government to carry on in maintaining and defending the confederacy and maintaining common services that will be carried out in that country or that confederacy as a whole. With all of these, we'd like to say we've come to the end of our class for today. But before we go, I'd like us to have a quick recap on all we learned today. We talked about confederal system of government, where we defined it as a group of sovereign states coming together to form a confederacy with a central government at the center. And then we saw that the system of confederacy, or in a confederal system of government, the component states are more powerful than the central government, thereby leaving the central government weak. And then we also looked at how powers are being exercised in a central system of government. Where we said the major powers are given to the states, individual states or component states to carry out and function in their respective countries or nations. And we looked at the characteristics of a confederal system of government, where we mentioned a few such as distribution of powers, we looked at how the constitution is being practiced and what kind of constitution is adopted, we looked at sovereignty and identity, the right to secede, provision of resources, and loyalty. This brings us to the end of our class for today, but let's just take a quick test to know how well we understood our lesson for today. The first question reads, which of these best defines a confederal system of government? A a system where the central government has authority over the states, B, a system where powers are evenly shared between the states and the central government, and C, a system where the states willingly contributes powers to the central government. Okay, if you picked A 
or B, you're wrong. Because we said in confederalism, the states have more powers and they also contribute powers or give powers to the central government, which is a weak government because the state is more powerful. And so our answer is C, a system of government where the state willingly contributes powers to the central government. The second question reads, which of these is not a feature of the confederal system of government? A, the member states of that confederacy have their sovereignty and identity with them. B, states have the right to withdraw from the confederacy. And C, states depend on the central government for resources. So which one of these is not a feature of the confederal system of government? If you picked A or B, you're wrong, because in the course of our lesson, we're told that the component states are highly depended on by the central government for resources with which it uses to maintain and also defend the confederacy. So our answer is C, states depend on the central government for resources is not a feature of the confederal system of government. With this, I'd like to say we've come to the end of today's lesson. I hope you learned a lot. Thank you.